Dead Scared Entertainment takes pleasure in presenting Goverda Darano, a journey into the phantasmagoric lands of folklore, literature, theater, and film. In the centuries-old tradition of the Romane people, we bring to you stories of superstition, fantasy, and adventure. There's no turning back. La Verda approaches. Chirachi Midwamal. Good evening, friend. I'm Esma Kalai. If you know me, you know I rarely stay in one place for long. The reason? Simple. There's so much in this world, the next, and the many thereafter that makes existence worth exploring. But, throughout the many journeys I have taken, I find there are things Things and people that connect them all together. It takes on the likeness of an ethereal spider web, glistening in between the stitches of each world and the next. This world you inhabit them all happens to have its strongest ties between mortal souls, alive and dead. Be it blood, tears, history, I find there are bonds between man that cannot be explained. Bonds of friendship. Bonds of horror. Tonight, Jasmina Von Thiel and Paulina Stevens, the Romane titans that make up the Romanistan podcast, sit side by side with us in our Verda Darano as we travel to places and people where fear lies within. There is no turning back. The bonds are molded. Your fate is sealed. Chirachi Deskar Entertainment. Thank you for joining in for yet another episode of the Haunting Overda Darano. Thank you for taking the time to join us on our journey. And today, I must say, we are taking a stop on one of the biggest episodes that we're doing thus far. One that we've been waiting for for a very long time, and I can't wait to get started. I would like to introduce today our two wonderful, amazing guests. I'll start out with Jasmina Von Thiel, writer, educator, fortune teller, and co-host of Romanistan Podcast, as well as Paulina Stevens, a Romani activist, writer, owner of Romani Holistic, and also co-host of Romanistan Podcast. And if you haven't caught it already, we have with us today the two giants that make up the Romanistan Podcast, world-renowned, and heralded among multiple cultures, including our own Roma culture. I cannot believe that we're sitting, Raquel. Could you believe this? I could believe it. Pinch me already. They're our best friends, duh. There you go. So I am so glad, and I truly welcome Jasmina and Paulina. Thank you so much for coming on. How are you both doing today? We're so happy to be here. Thank you so much. We love you both so much. <laughs> We love you too. We love yeah, you too. We're definitely honored. Um, it's so funny the way that you talk about us because we feel that way about you guys. I literally <laughs> love your podcast. I do. <laughs> well, gosh, we're all we're all bush and orange. <laughs> we're all fangirling. <laughs> I swear, I'm getting three different shades of red at this point. <laughs> so no, but I'm, again, thank you guys for doing this with us and i can't wait to get started because it's like we've been talking for over i don't know how many years now you like we've been in contact for sure um and it's we're finally getting down to the nitty-gritty and it's 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 been too long in my opinion too long <laughs> so why not let's not let's not waste any more time and let's kind of let's start at the beginning um so where are you both from where did you grow up 
And what was your like? Uh, what was your experience like growing up Rom? So let's see. I am from New Hampshire. I was born in Massachusetts, um, but I grew up mostly in New Hampshire. And uh, yeah, really, only my grandma's my maternal grandma side of the family is Romani. Uh, they're Sinti. And, um, but my grandma pretty much raised me (laughs) like, you know, my mom was there, but my grandma was there almost all the time. And I didn't, um, you know, because of my fascinating backstory and family drama, didn't really feel that connected to my dad's side of the family. And so my grandma really tucked me under her wing. And when I was really little, um, she started telling me about her culture and she wanted to start teaching me the family trade. And so we were working on fortune telling when I was just four years old and it was uh, a truly magical experience uh, for me because I felt like I got all this time with her and this beautiful trailer tucked like all decorated with um, antiques that she had, you know, every time she would go to Germany to visit her family where she's from, she would, you know, take a couple things back and she showed me like a few little treasures, like a big scary wooden crucifix that she really liked and all kinds of things. Yeah. And um, yeah, and so it, I felt like I was having all these kind of special magical experiences with the family member that understood me the best. And, um, and so it just, even though, you know, I have family from, you know, different backgrounds that was really the part of myself that I identified most with and um, as far as growing up from in New Hampshire um, you know it was kind of the typical thing where my grandma told me not to tell anyone that we were gypsies Um, when I was five I told some people we were gypsies (laughs) so um, in the part of New Hampshire I was in, which is Epsom, New Hampshire, which is kind of near the White Mountains, um, that was really where a lot of Roma back in the seven, well, up until about the seventies, um, would actually be. Um, but I think it was in the seventies actually when a lot of Roma were like kicked out of New Hampshire. And so for some of the kids who were asking, Cause you know, I'm not, I'm not super dark skinned or anything. I'm pretty light skinned, but for New Hampshire, um, I was Brown. <laughs> so a lot of the kids, yeah. Were, yeah, a lot of the kids were, um, you know, wanted to know where I was from, why I had a tan all the time. And I kind of like got tired of dodging the question. And I was like, and I spoke a little bit with my grandma's accent too. And so they were like, you're foreign. Where are you from? And I was like, you know, um, you know, we're just, uh, we're, uh, we're Italian. And they're like, no, 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 no. I'm like, we're, we're, we're maybe gypsies. And that was when a couple of kids latched onto it. A lot of the kids didn't know, but, um, what that meant, but yeah, I had like rocks thrown at me. Things kind of changed at that point. And, um, I had a few weird little things happen in New Hampshire that were like I had a fifth grade teacher who gave me detention for giving the evil eye, which was like clearly kind of a racialized thing. Like no other kids were getting detention for that. Um, when I was like 10, I was wearing uh, a Diplo that I borrowed from my grandma. I thought it was so pretty and I was wearing it all the time. Um, and a police officer pulled me over and told me that I looked like a runaway and um, like detained me. And I had to tell him my dad was just down the street. It took over an hour. It was really traumatic. Like five cop cars pulled up. They were all yelling at me and saying that they had pictures of me and that I was itinerant and wanted. (laughs) It was just like very traumatizing. Um, But for the most part, like from some of those standout things, most people didn't. I stopped talking about it when we moved when I was like 10. I stopped talking about being Romani or I think I was like 11 or 12. Um, And it was partially we moved out of that town because we just couldn't really fit in. Um, But yeah, other than that, it was more something that was more private. And I didn't really talk about it again until um, I was in college. But I was also starting to work fortune telling parties when I was like 12. And I uh, my mom's family worked with horses and uh, as well. And so I would do um, like healing on horses that were lame and things like that. Uh, my mom didn't want me around horses. She was like, you picked fortune telling. You can't do horses. <laughs> so, um, so, so, yeah, it was mostly kind of like a private thing just with my mom's side of the family. And my, my family in Germany, while they're like really warm and wonderful, 
they really, really, really do not want to identify as Romani. They feel like they're assimilated. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hang out with local Roma. So I try to leave them out of what I do. And I just kind of focus on me. I had my grandma on the podcast once, but other than that, it's always been something that's been private, except for me. He won't stop talking about it. <laughs> Got you. No, that's wow. There were so many things that you just, like you said, essentially being detained, had rocks thrown at you. I mean, the, just the fact that you got detention for the evil eye, my God, if that was the case, I would have probably been suspended. Yeah. I would have been suspended. God. I mean, can we help it? <laughs> It is what it is, but I'm so glad that throughout all of that, you were able to, at least you were able to retain that pride in the end, you know, because I know it's one thing, it's it's easy to assimilate, but it's another thing that when it's just, you just can't help it, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was my grandma, I think, because she was so tough. Like everything about her was tough. Everything that she survived was incredible. Like, you know, she was hiding in plain sight when she was a kid, like living with a German farmer and the thing. And he was super abusive and crazy. And it was like, there's Nazis in the backstories of her, like everything that she talks about. There's her hiding in plain sight. There's her peeing her pants when Nazis were raiding the house because they were suspicious. There was like all these crazy things. And then she gets to America with an American soldier who is a monster and she survives him too. <laughs> and she leaves him when he's like, committed to an asylum like it's just so everything that she went through and the whole time she was like i'm proud of who i am i'm a gypsy we should be proud we're survivors they can never kill us and it was just like this this mantra of like we're like dandelions they cannot get rid of us <laughs> and it was like okay i really felt that like i was going through my own hard stuff when i was a kid and i was like yes it is is the gypsy in me that is getting me through this but, i mean it was she's a remarkable that's amazing. Now, she sounds remarkable. She does. Now, does your grandmother tell sort of her backstory on the episode that you mentioned on Romanistan, or is that more or less something that maybe might come in the future? Well, I was lucky that when we started recording, um, she still had her wits about her a little more. And so I asked her, you know, um, I think we were asking her, why are you proud to be a gypsy? And so she talked about that. And she she's interesting, too, because she feels like because she doesn't live in Romana Penn so much or, you know, when she moved to America, she left her family behind. And so she uses past tense, like when we were gypsies, because she feels mm. like that's changed. Um, and so it's I think talking about Romani identity, it's still kind of hard for her. And when I told her that I'm writing this book with Paulina um, about Romani fortune telling, she was like, you're doing too much. <laughs> I was like, okay. And I don't think she knows what a podcast is. So I don't think she understood yeah. really like that she was being recorded for, for a, like everyone to listen to. Yeah. So that also gave me a little, like I was trying to explain to her what it was, but she wasn't really, she's a little confused. She's been through a lot. Um, and so <laughs> I've mostly like written down a lot of the stories that she's told me, but I don't think she's in a place to like tell them as much herself anymore. But I'm glad that we got a little bit of it that's great so hopefully to some extent either through your own quotes from what you've received from her or something it would be great to hear that story as well because that's again that's a huge chunk of the experience that really flavors the roma like the romana experience today because that's like our grandparents who raised us for the most part in particular me especially when it comes to the music side of things so I, again, it would be great to hear some of this stuff and be able to, you know, share those stories at some point whenever you guys are ready with that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Paulina, what about you? What, what about your background? Not much. Not a real interesting life. No. <laughs> <laughs> there is a whole podcast just about your life. I was just going to say, yeah. if, you, if you aren't familiar with Paulina and her podcast with the LA Times Foretold, um, I hope that you have about maybe a good, what, 24 hours worth of time on your hands to just sit there and listen to that whole story. Because that's basically uh, what I've been listening to this whole time that I've been working on stuff for Halloween was this whole story. And I love it. I love this, you know. But for the most part, if you want to condense some of that <laughs> and give us a good taste of what it is, um, go ahead for it, Paulina. You go for it. Um, yeah, so I am... Um, much Wyatt Roma, and I was 
raised in the U.S. My family came from Serbia. And what else? Um, I was raised like in Romani Pen. So basically I had an arranged marriage and then I had two kids and then I left that. I kind of wanted to, I used to wear a head covering, like my long D claw. So I can definitely, you know, relate like with like Jess, like other Roma, like I think um, like getting strip searched at the airport was always a thing. We'd get like spit on and thrown out of like restaurants and places like in Las Vegas most of the time, I think, cause there's just a lot of people from like all over the world. Um, what else? I basically um, do a lot of activism. I think like we do like at Romanistan, that's kind of our thing is like we want to lift the voices of like other Roma. So we do a lot of activism. I have that podcast with the LA Times that just kind of walks people through um, my story, kind of what it was like coming out um, into the American world, my custody battle with my kids, um, and basically like walking the line between both worlds of American life and gypsy life. Um, also, I still refer to myself as gypsies, you know, just for anyone that might like be confused or whatever, like I refer to myself as a gypsy. And that's really it. I have a store, Romani Holistic, that I opened about two years ago. Um, and I still practice like fortune telling. And I also do like holistic healing practices. And um, yeah, and that's it. And I live in California. <laughs> My gosh. So what was Halloween like growing up? What was your favorite Halloween or autumn memory? Okay. Do you want me to go? Yeah. yeah. Are you excited? Go for it. <laughs> I'm excited. Okay. So we most, for the most part, when we weren't living in LA or San Francisco, we were living in a small town like Morro Bay off the coast of California. And it's right in between actually San Francisco and LA, like central coast. So it's kind of dead for some reason. But it was this little like beach town, fisherman's town. And during Halloween, it is spooky, like 24 hours a day like it's foggy there like it doesn't matter what season it is like it's always foggy in this little beach town and basically my parents owned the only like psychic witchy shop so i know like you guys can imagine like i think the first day of September, not even like August, my mom was already like bringing out the Halloween decorations. Like it was such a big time of the year for us. And like everybody in the town knew to like come to my parents. And so just because just for the experience. So Halloween was like just a really big deal on top of like business. And then just the feeling in general, like our Halloween decorations were like three tubs, but like our Christmas decorations were like a half a tub or something. <laughs> so yeah, Halloween was always a big deal. Sometimes we would have like spooky house walkthroughs like in our like office or in our house, a lot of Halloween parties and it's still my favorite. So that's what it was like growing up, always dressing up to the nines. Um, and it, it, what was really fun too was like running like fairs. So around 15 or 16, I was like working in nightclubs, like giving readings on Halloween. And I just remember that was like, just the beginning of like whoa this is such a cool life like being an entertainer kind of well that's amazing now one question i figured now that now that you said this because we've had roma and we talked to roma that are completely on the polar opposite where it's like well halloween is considered a very evil holiday and like from a religious standpoint because we know a lot of roma can be very um zealous when it comes to their religion very strong about how they feel about it so like was do you find that like the and again maybe you this might be just speaking from your family's perspective not necessarily a general like the much why in general but do you feel like that's like sort of like a like a visa wide belief about the holiday or would you find that there's again it depends on the family and depends on the situation 
I would say it definitely depends on the family. Because my parents were secluded, again, like it's kind of not normal for like gypsies to live far away from like their aunts and, and uncles and brothers and sisters, like especially once you get older. I'm sure you guys can relate. Like, yeah, of course. You know, yeah, like when your parents move, even if it's just like a few hours away, um, it allows for a certain level of like growth and creativity that they would normally, I think, be heavily judged for. So I do remember like scary movies was also a big thing in my in our household. So when my mom would like bring her DVDs right <laughs> to. Yeah. Um, the family's house, they'd be like, oh, my God, like, you know, Tutu, like, get this away from me. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's wrong with you people? Um, and so <laughs> we do a tweet. <laughs> yeah, tweet, tweet. <laughs> Get away from us. Uh, get that shit out of here. You know, I don't believe in that. Like, it was crazy thing. Mm hmm yeah well, because really you want to talk like i'll say this i didn't mean to cut you off but if you really want to talk about like the, oh, the complete the like separation between the two like it's like i can't this is that's really her and then, but see the thing is though yeah, I, like so this funny. is also like going off tangent but i just wanted to say this for our viewers mm -hmm. it's so like it feels so like um i can't find like a word it feels so comfortable talking to you guys for the simple fact that we can't say these things or like laugh at these you know what i mean like it's such like um like a common practice within our people i feel like um mm -hmm. to say those certain words or to have those certain feelings about you know whatever and when you're talking about these things to you know Gaja or like American people or like you know whatever they just don't get it they don't understand you know the difference so I really appreciate you you know giving those little ad libs or whatever in there because I feel like it's very it's very much important for people to kind of see that side of us as well you know um yeah anyway but Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was it. Yeah, it varies. Like even between you guys, like between you two both, like it varies, you know? <laughs> no, literally, yeah. Complete yeah. polar opposite. <laughs> this, is, this is my this is my time to shine, but then give it another month or two and then this one's in her glories. So <laughs> but I love Halloween. I absolutely love Halloween. I don't see anything for me, I don't look at Halloween like um like an evil holiday or anything. I know there's like, a, it's considered pagan or, you know, whatever. But from the way that I look at it, I just think of it as a time to feel like, I don't know, spooky, dress up and have fun. I, I think it's fun. I love Halloween. I don't know. Now you heard that here. We have proof of this. This is, <laughs> this is evidence to be used in, in a court of law with this Wait, one. Dead, scared, entertainment loves Halloween. I'm so shocked. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is is i can't deal the the point is is i can't deal with like movies and things that deal with like occultism or like possession or like something like that when it deals with like a religious aspect like the nun like i'm not gonna watch something like that because i will literally shit myself <laughs> So that's, that's I just can't. That's my favorite. That's my favorite. I need to have a heart attack. Like, I need yeah. to be on the edge of, like, my life. Like, I need to have a heart attack. That's the kind of movies I like. You need to see the Pope's Exorcist in that case. I watched it. I love it. It was pretty, it was pretty damn good, I gotta say. It was, it was see, I love that. I, to me, it's like, it's like, I'll, to give you, again, a little bit of a tangent, but it's, give you an idea i hate roller coasters so last year i went to disney world for a wedding celebration and me and like my closest friends all went and they all knew i hated roller coasters they forced me to go on the biggest one in disney world uh expedition everest right mm -hmm. so went on there dying as we're going up next thing all you hear once we drop all you hear is yeah <laughs> I'm going all the way down. <laughs> next thing I know, I was a junkie for it for the next few days. I loved it. So it's like, <laughs> that's what scary movies give me is that little bit of rush, that extra bit. So completely, completely agree with you on that. Completely. So yeah, it's fun. 
but I love I love the fact that we're that we're able to talk about the variation in that because it's true. Like even when even when we went to do the Romani flag raising here in Chicago when that happened in April, um, like a lot of the Roma that were there were they were welcoming, but then they also were kind of confused because they saw like the coffin shape on my shirt and like they were asking about the what's it called about the company essentially, and it was a little confusing because they know that again. Some are cool with it, some aren't. So it is what it is. But your your upbringing, like now, the way that your family treats it, awesome. I love that. That's super cool. How about you when it comes to Halloween? What was Halloween like growing up for you? What were the positives and all that stuff and all the, the great memories or maybe some scary ones? Yeah, my family loved it. Um, I think, I don't know. So I think my grandma's like a little bit of a rebel. And so I don't know if it would have been different had she been like living in Germany or something. But she was just like, should we um, pull some cards and see what the ancestors maybe have to say? Should we get your costume right? <laughs> like she was very much like, I mean, I remember one of the things she told me, it's like, she's like, as soon as I moved to America, I put on a pair of pants. <laughs> like, so I think she's just very sassy and just like likes what she likes. Um, I don't remember her really getting into like horror movies or anything, but my mom loved certain types of scary movies, especially the vintage ones. Mm. And um, my mom and auntie were both like really big fans of dressing up and being elaborate and being kind of spicy and <laughs> like using Halloween Halloween as an excuse to um, like become Vampira or Elvira or like some kind of terrifying, beautiful monster creature. And um, and I always wanted to do everything that they were doing, but they would make a kid's version of it. And they'd be like, you can be Catwoman, but here's a kind of like loose <laughs> kind of garb for you to be Catwoman. And I was like, I don't look like Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> <laughs> And you won't, but, um, but, you know, we always had so much fun. They got really into it. They, my mom loved decorating. She was um, an artist and um, I mean, she did a lot of things uh, like she worked a lot of different types of jobs, but her favorite thing was to make things and she would um, collect snake skins from the woods and she would cut off um, like the roots of beets and make like a jar of rat tails. Like she did all this really cool stuff and she would like buy, you know, things too. She made her own monsters. And then when I got a little older, when we moved to the new house, um, we put on a haunted house every Halloween and it got so big that the, like other towns were coming to see her haunted garage because she got so into it. And my mom, like my mom, my auntie, my dad and my grandma would all dress up and like make the spooky sounds. And like they got so into it. I would help. My friends would help. And it was like so my mom died in 2020. And when they started trick or treating again, like the kids were coming around to our house and they'd be like, we heard about your mother. And we just want you to say we just want you to know we love you so much and we love her so much. And she made our childhood so fun. And I'm like, you're still a child. <laughs> just like wow. really really heartwarming that she like left such an impression on the neighborhood it's also very sad but um cool. yeah so halloween was a big deal i always loved it and i started working parties and stuff too when i was a teenager and that was really fun um i've always loved it oh that's so cool how would you approach like a halloween party in terms of like going out and actually uh potentially are you just like introduce yourself like what was that process like during like those types of situations aside from just like now just having your own like storefront and somebody walking in during the season for me it was um mostly because i lived in a rural part of the country and so um it was mostly like my auntie's friends parties like yeah. i would be supervised and i would read for them and i don't think anyone ever explained like that it was a family trade or anything it was just like Oh, you know, Zena's family, they do fortune telling uh, and horses. And it wasn't like really explained. Um, and it was very like, you know, I wasn't reading a nightclub. So I was like living in New York in my early 30s. But <laughs> yeah. How about you, Paulina? Um, I think this brings to mind like 
you know, cultural appropriation like never existed, like for us growing up, like we've never heard of that, you know, before. And we would sometimes dress up as gypsies. So like that was a thing that we would do. And I remember like, you know, it was just such a funny thing because people in the town were like, oh, my God, the gypsies are dressing up as gypsies. And so it was like kind of cool. And as time went by, like other people, you know, we noticed there were like, you know, Godre, like outsiders dressing up as gypsies as well. And we would always be like, oh, like they're not like really gypsy. Like, you know, we would say things like in our language or whatever, like, oh, they're like, like they're fake, you know what I mean? And I just feel like it was so funny because if if like that was like you know back in the day we would be like oh like we actually know like it's actually wrong to dress up as us because it felt wrong at the time you know what i mean but it even felt wrong for us we were like are we even allowed to dress up as gypsies you know what i mean like with the coin belts and we would put our head coverings on like for the people that normally don't wear the head coverings but i don't know it was funny did you guys ever like dress up as gypsies yeah i would do it literally for spite just for the simple fact that i feel like a lot of my stuff honestly my style as a like a young girl was very much what you would kind of see um like the short little skirt like costume that you'd get from party city you know with like the head little you know scarf or whatever and the little coins you know yeah. I feel like I was just dressing <clears throat> like that on a daily basis. My style was very, very much not, um, I don't know, Very, it was not a basic style, if that makes sense. And mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people knew that I was Rom. So for spite, it would kind of be like a dig, you know? Mm-hmm. But if people would, uh, like genuinely ask me like oh are you dressed up like what are you dressed as they just they couldn't get it i guess um i would say oh i'm a pirate (laughs) i'm a pirate and kind of just left it at that you know it was always something i feel like i don't know i'm very expressive with my clothes even till today i feel so i don't know I don't know. It's it's very if I if I would see somebody with a gypsy costume, obviously who's not gypsy, I w- first of all I have a big mouth. Let me just say that. <laughs> Especially when I go out, I like to give a dirty look. I oh, no. <laughs> I love I that is my time to shine because as you can tell, <clears throat> for the viewers, they're not going to see this, but. We're obviously behind the white curtain. I'm as white as the curtain in back of me. You know, like, people don't, like, they're not going to say that I'm gypsy because of just the way that I I present myself, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, if you're not really, like, in the full get up, you're not going to, you know what I mean? They're not going to understand or believe you. Um, but yeah, no, I love to argue with people when I'm out and tell them, <laughs> you really like, do you know what you're doing? You know? Um, but <laughs> aside from that, um, yeah, no, I, I, I did dress up like that when I was younger, but I mm-hmm. thought it was appropriate because I would wear that on a normal basis anyway. Like, yeah. You are no, no basic bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can. But yeah, so I mean, for the most part, that's for me, it was pretty simple. I came in two flavors for Halloween. It was either Dracula, which is my usual, just because honestly, I don't even need to wear the costume anymore. I just walk out the door and I get the same response. It is what it is. Or at least when it was popular or maybe it was a little colder, I would be Batman. But that's it. I maybe once went as like a lumberjack. But the only time that was at a Paul party, college party. 
And I just um, had to throw something together. But outside of that, like, I never seen, like, any of the boys ever, like, try to go for the whole the whole shebang. Even though my papu, he gave me his um, his little mono vest that, like, uh, he would, that you essentially would go to play with. Um, it's black and gold with, like, this beautiful sort of, like, gold um, embroidery. embroidery. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And I wore it for the only times I wear it now is if I'm going to play, if there ever is like a Romane like sort of event going on. Outside of that, it's usually just a suit, but But that's kind of the, the your uniform. Everybody yeah, wears exactly. that when they go to play. That's not even something that's part. like a costume. Yeah. If that makes sense. Because it's what we genuinely wear. But as for costumes for Yeah, we never wore that. The boys men, never did that. So. No one I don't think I've ever seen any boy like dress up like as a like a gypsy boy you know what i mean like, yeah they just wear t-shirt jeans white lumberjack though huh? <laughs> yeah, that's i funny. can't imagine you as a lumberjack that's like cracking me up because you're so like not a lumberjack like i feel like you do embody um dracula like even when you're not like that's, that's, who that's who he genuinely thinks that he is, is Dracula. i wouldn't even say i think i am it's just so much of my life he said i don't think i am i know no it's... <laughs> <That's the context. laughs> listen we're trying to interview them we're not trying to get into any gritty on this side just yet. <laughs> well but yeah i more or less i just realized that so much of what i'm into just more or less just paints that picture so it is what it is What were your like favorite like scary movies and what was like maybe one or two particular movies that scared you the most growing up or like even now? Okay. Um, I guess I'll go first. So one of my all time favorite scary movies is the skeleton key. Um, do have you guys watch that? I've seen bits of it. I need to watch that one. It is, I don't know what about it, but I think it takes place like maybe in like Louisiana. And so there's this like swampy vibe to it. And there's also like, I don't know, connections between like horror and race and religious practices. And I don't know, I don't want to spoil the ending, but it's one of those like, like it's just really fucked up. And Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's definitely one of my favorite movies. And what else? I mean, I love horror. I mean, The Grudge also, that was one of my favorites as well. I mean, it's just classic. You know what I mean? (laughs) At this point, yeah, it's, you can't not include that. Truly. Scared the shit out of me. That's for sure. Growing up. I still get scared. Like, I don't stop getting scared from The Grudge, like, no matter what. Like, It just freaks the fuck out of me. Um, <laughs> what about you, Jess? So my my favorite genre of scary movies is like vengeful femme spirit wreaks havoc on everyone. Like that's sort of <laughs> like my favorite genre. <laughs> I love a good revenge story. I love a beautiful woman who's actually terrifying. Like that's my favorite. Um, but as far as like some specific, so the, the movie that scared me the most as a kid was actually The Ring. And I didn't really watch a lot of scary movies when I was a kid. And I saw The Ring when I was 14 in the theaters with my friend. And we were, we snuck in. We were so terrified. We actually clutched each other the whole time. <laughs> I <like>, couldn't speak. <laughs> then I had this like elderly pug that... I had to walk really early in the morning because that was when he needed to go outside. And so like, it would be misty in the woods and I'd be like, oh my God, she's coming to get me. (laughs) Just like that stage with me for a year. (laughs) 
Um, but some favorites, I know, like I was saying, the Vengeful Femme Spirits, those are all my favorites. There's so many of them, but also some that are not that genre. Um, Gary Oldman in Dracula in 1992. It's just like a stunning film. Everything about it is beautiful, uh, like in terrifying and camp. It's like the perfect combination of those things. A wolf takes himself to the cinema. Like, what more could you want? Like, he goes to the movie theater as a wolf. <laughs> and so I'm really, yeah. really pleased about that. <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of like a favorite. Like, it reminds me of my mom. My mom used to watch it all the time. She loved it. And everything about it, the soundtrack. She thought it was the best oh, love story yeah. ever told. Yes. Um, and I'm just, it says so much about her that she was like, this is the most romantic thing I've ever seen. And there's like blood and guts everywhere. <laughs> and it's like incredibly toxic. <laughs> but That's she was correct. fascinating and I loved her. <laughs> but, You're a passionate woman in that case because. She, yes, she totally was. And I also love yeah. Midsummer as a more like current one. I would watch that over and over again. It just so much catharsis. Um, anyone who's ever been in a really toxic uh, relationship <laughs> would probably enjoy that. And the group crying, I found very touching. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like I have to mention like um, Jordan Peel- Peely or Jordan Peel. Peel yeah. yeah Peel. His movies are just like on another fucking level. Like That's Get so Out true. is like. Twisted. Yeah. yeah. Truly I mean, twisted. Who comes up with that shit? Like, and then the other one I love is, I think it's just us. Have you guys seen it? That one I need to watch. Ugh, yeah. I haven't seen it yet. It's terrifying. A, yeah. Oh my gosh. Just, I really want to. It's not so much the jump scares, but it's his storylines are just so twisted that like you can't, you like, you just sit and you feel uncomfortable. Like your skin is crawling. Um, mm. but yeah, they're good. So yeah. Love that. That's see, that's the thing I gotta say. It's, it's so tough today to get scared essentially from the films because of just how much is in the media. And then if you grew up with it, like how we did essentially, uh, to whatever extent it may be, you become desensitized so quick. So it's like to have like that creepy crawly feeling, you know, like sort of like where it's like, you don't know necessarily if you're still sitting in your chair or what's going on, but something's up. Love that. Love that stuff. But I actually have one more story. Uh, one that it. I need to interject. So the Vengeful Femme Spirit, I think my favorite one is this um, Indian film that came out in 2020 called Boo Boo. Mm-hmm. And um, it's incredible. It's in Hindi. I, I watched it on Netflix. It might still be there, but it's incredible. If that's your your thing. Go for it. What was it called again? Boo Boo? Uh, yeah, Boo Boo. B-U-L B-B-U-L. That means no, no, no. but no, just, you can remember it. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> and it's an Indian film too, so I know. I'm like, it might like, actually mean that. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Are there a lot of bulls in the movie? Um, no? Not as much as you would expect. <laughs> <clears throat> well, then no good. <laughs> I, I, I'm still gonna watch it though. I'm trying to get slowly. I'm slowly getting into some foreign horror, fil- foreign horror films because I can't speak English. But yeah, for the most part though, no, nah, I love that recommendation. If you got any other, yeah, if you guys have any other recommendations, always toss that to me. Just so then that's another on the thousand one other movies I gotta watch at some point. You mm, know, it's important to that list. <laughs> Ah, 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 ah. This episode keeps getting spookier and spookier. I know. I'm dead scared. You mean dead scared entertainment. Come on. Let's just tell the listeners they can have more fantastic fun after the show on deadscaredentertainment.com. She's right. There you can find all our episodes of Oberda Darano, drawing videos, and most importantly, our store. We've got t-shirts, hoodies, and more. It's a great way to show your spooky pride, as well as fund some frightening film projects. It's like putting money back in your pocket. So don't forget them all. Head on over to DeadScaredEntertainment.com And now, back to Overda Darano. That's it. I'm not sleeping tonight. The lights are starting to dim and starting to get a little, the air is getting thick right now. So what are some spooky stories you could share with us? 
So I talk, we talked a bit about this on the Ramana Sun podcast. So I'm going to summarize a little bit and then give you a more recent one. Sure. Um, but there is something to be said for the like tui tui, like don't get that around me because I grew up in haunted houses my whole life. And I kind of feel like my mom was a little bit of a magnet for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the house that she grew up in was super, super haunted. And we talk about that on our first um, Romana Sun podcast story. And so when I was a kid and I started seeing, um, I started seeing this big cloaked figure in the house all the time, like the Grim Reaper without a scythe. And I would be like, mom, I'm seeing this, this person. Like I was like five, I was terrified. And she was like, he doesn't like it when you talk about him. And I was like, what? <laughs> Rather than like, no, honey, there's nothing. <laughs> no, it was, he doesn't like it when you talk about him. And I think this, I get the sense actually, it was hard to get her to talk about it directly, but I think my mom was actually like haunted by a spirit like most of her life. And um, I have some theories for it, but it was um, kind of perpetual in the house when I was growing up. And so I could always see spirits right away. But if we were somewhere else and I saw a spirit, my mom was really, really specific about how we were supposed to deal with it because she, for one of her many like hustles um, over the years, she used to love to um, refinish antique furniture that in it, like in its state wasn't worth anything. And she, you know, do magic to it and then sell it. And so we used to go to estate sales all the time and she would always be like, okay, well, someone died in this house and we need to be respectful and, you know, don't do anything, don't touch anything without asking, you know, and, you know, be polite, don't make noise. Like this is a place of death. You have to honor that. But it, the first time when I was like eight and I um, saw the old woman who had died in that house sitting in her bed and she hissed at me, put that down when I picked up a little cat figurine and I like ran out to my mom and was like, <laughs> she yelled at me for picking up the cat figurine. I think I have to go wait in the car. And she's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> She was so like disappointed. She's like, just because you saw a ghost, did you even ask if you could pick up the cat figurine? That is so rude. So I mean, she was a really interesting lady, very comfortable with the spirit world. And like one of the reasons my mother wasn't a fortune teller is my grandma thought it would be bad luck because when she was really little, she could look at someone and know if they were going to die a violent or tragic death soon. And she was never wrong, not once. And most of the time there was nothing that could be done. And so my grandma was like, you're bad luck. Like, you're not going to be a fortune teller. <laughs> this is bad for business. I don't know what your deal is. It's not great. And so um, I think my mother also felt like she kind of, the way she put it, she was like, I have one foot on the other side at all times. And she kind of was like that. She was, she had a lot of illnesses. She struggled a lot with her mental health and she was super magical and could see spirits and talk to spirits and predict everyone's death. And it was unnerving for her and for everyone around her. Sure. Um, and yeah, so it was, she was very, very casual about the kinds of spirits that I think maybe were attracted to her. I'm not sure. But I remember when I was having a sleepover with my friend, um, I was telling her, she was like, your house is kind of spooky. And I was like, yeah, girl, <laughs> you don't know the half of it. And so I started talking about, you know, the one who didn't like to be spoken about. And I was like, I see this guy in a cloak sometimes. It's really scary. And we're like 10. No, we're, we're, I think we're 12. And all of a sudden my bed lifts up a few feet and drops. And we both just screamed and like ran into my mom's room. And we were like, but then lifted up. And she's like, you were talking about him. And we're just like, <laughs> so terrifying. <laughs> it was just, there was nowhere to go for comfort. <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. And so that was kind of like my childhood where it was, it was just kind of an undercurrent of like, I live in a haunted house and no one seems that upset about it except for me. And so I just kind of had to adjust. Um, but as I got older, I think it got a little more um, intense. And my dad even started noticing it. And he's not, or he is now, but back then he wasn't particularly sensitive to anything. And um, he happened to be really, really good friends with this really lovely um, Navajo Cherokee or Dine and uh, Cherokee. Um, basically, she's a medicine woman. She's really lovely. 
And she came over and did some blessings on our house and on my mom. And that helped things a bit. Um, but, you know, it was, she would have to kind of do it regularly because they make their way back. And my mom would start, ta- start talking about spirits she was seeing and we'd be like, oh, we should call Lisa. <laughs> <Get her. laughs> um, but the more recent scary thing that happened to me, and I'm saving this one just for you guys, because this is I feel like this is a specifically scary Romani story. Like, sure. I feel like Americans wouldn't get why this is terrifying. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So my auntie, Zena, who I also adored, died shortly after my mother. Um, And I, so that was a few years ago now. She died in 2021. And I was just having like a day. Like, I don't know if y'all ever get super dramatic, but I do in the privacy of my own home. (laughs) So I had done something very silly. I had just like, I'd been tired. Also, I think my apartment is like mildly haunted, but I try not to think about it too much. But I had been very tired. I put my remote on my bed. I was going to have a snack and watch maybe RuPaul's Drag Race or something and just, you know, be done with my work day. And I got up for a second to check on something on the stove, came back to my bed. The remote was gone. And I was like, what the hell? And I like after long COVID, I kind of have memory issues a little bit. And so I was like, oh, I'm so flighty and forgetful. And I'm just like, have a long day. I'm not feeling it. And I'm feeling kind of like, oh, what did I do with this remote? And I looked for it for like a half an hour. And for the first 15 minutes, it was kind of funny. And then the last 15 minutes, I like had a meltdown because it was like, (laughs) (laughs) my mind. And I was like, and I, I'm blaming myself at this point where I was like, I, my brain doesn't even work anymore. I'm going to die young like my mom and auntie. I'm a, like just going on and on and on. And as soon as I said, I'm going to die young like my mom and auntie, I was like, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that out loud. And then um, I was like, you know what? Fuck the remote. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so screw the remote. I'm no, going you can, well, you're all good. Go in. Go all in. so i just i was like i'm gonna watch rupaul's drag race on my computer it's fine i don't need a remote like i I can live through this (laughs) like you know pumping myself up i will survive this and um so hours pass and i'm just about to get into bed and i hear like a whisper outside of my head say the remote's inside the bed and i was like what and i have like a hollow box spring and so i lifted up the mattress and the remote is in the center of the box spring and i was like i hate that (laughs) it's just like i don't want to know who that was because i can get like that too because i sometimes i'm you know sometimes i'm the fortune teller and i'm telling you what your granny is saying and i'm like doing all that spirit stuff but when i'm tired and i want to get go to bed i do not know i don't want to know who that spirit is i don't (laughs) don't want to know who put my remote there or who told me i'm just like i hate that no thank you and so I go to bed, fall asleep, and I have this dream about my auntie Zena, and I don't dream about her that much. And also, as we all know, when you dream about an ancestor, maybe they're coming to get you. Like maybe it's your time. And so, <laughs> so yeah. I, in the dream, um, before I actually see my auntie, in the dream, I know that I'm driving somewhere. And I know that I'm driving to the darkest place on earth where there's no sunlight ever. And I keep getting all these phone calls from my friends in the dream saying like, hey, if you're going to go on this trip, you need to know you can't eat anything there because you like that's in a different world. You you won't survive. You'll die if you eat something there. So bring snacks. And I'm like, "Okay, I I didn't know. Thank you for telling me. Hang up. And then someone else calls and they're like, hey, if you get out of the car, you need to be wearing a coat because you will die in 30 seconds because it's so cold. And I'm like, oh, good thing I have a coat. Thank you for telling me. And I kept getting these phone calls of people being like, okay, so if you go, (laughs) you're going to die if you don't do this. And I'm just like, all right, thank you. And it was like the whole way up. And so I finally get to this nightclub that is seemingly at the darkest place in the world. And I pull up and I just like, I'm sitting in the middle of the parking lot in my car. And I'm like, why am I here? And I see my auntie come like kind of peer out of the door. And she's wearing this like adorable sparkly mini dress that she would be. 
And I used to joke all the time, too, that like if my mom and auntie were like, you know, in heaven, heaven would be them dancing with their favorite drag queens in a nightclub. Like that's what they want to do. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, it's auntie. And I hear the music pounding and she's like, Jesse, get in here. And I was like, OK, hold on. And so I open up the car door and I'm like, oh, I need a coat. And she's like, forget it. Get in here. And I was like, no, I'll just be a second. I just need a coat. You have to get in here. And she starts getting frantic. And she's like, leave the coat. Get in here. And she's like calling me more frantically. And I'm like, I'm just putting on a coat. And then I like I'm looking at my keys and I'm like, where am I supposed to park? And she's like, forget it. Get in here. Get in here now. Hurry up. Get in here. And I was like, oh, weird. And so I'm like trying to like lock the door and the keys fall out of my hand. And as soon as they fall out of my hand, I'm like, that's not a nightclub. And it was like, Oh my God. And I woke up because my dog jumped on my chest and barked in my face. Like, <laughs> don't go in the nightclub. And I was like, the nightclub was the other side. I told her that I was going to die young and she came to get me. <laughs> Just like, I was so terrified. I could not speak. And the way that my auntie lived her life was very much like, you know, she was a little bit on the rebellious side of if I couldn't sleep because, you know, bad things were happening, we weren't going to fix the bad things. We were going to stay up all night and watch movies because, you know what, bad things happen for her, too. And she doesn't sleep either. And so I just felt like she was like, OK, you're done. You said you were done. And I was like, no, I didn't. Mean it. And I'm just <laughs> oh, my God. I like, yeah, I put out a little plate for her food and I'm like, hey, girl, stay away from me. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> just just do the afterlife <laughs> don't come get me not yet oh, but i'm terrified <laughs> that's funny yeah that's like such a gypsy thing too like get their food out and like light them a cigarette and like get the yeah. <laughs> yeah i really oh my gosh crazy no nah, honestly i can't tell you i will say the good thing with me at least uh, me personally the dreams that i have very little with very much in some ways it's a good thing usually when i see like family it is like more in a positive sense it's like a message if anything but i've thank god i haven't had anybody say yeah come on let's go we gotta do this, this is it i'm like no i'm not i'm that's I get them all the time. I'm not even kidding. Really? Like I get that literally all the time, but mm -hmm. I know that it's not like I, like I could look at them. Like I could see the image of like my Bubba and it's not like, I know it's not her. Mm -hmm. Like it's something that's like taking her image, you know, and they're very forceful. Mm -hmm. And I'm always saying like, mm -hmm. I'm not, no, thank you. Or I'll be confused and I'm kind of, I always look like around me, like, is someone else here that's going to stop this from happening? You know, like, is somebody going to protect me here? Mm -hmm. And most of the time they'll be like, a, it's literally like, where's Waldo? My dreams. They'll be <laughs> like, I'll see like a cardboard figure of like my father, you know, <laughs> and my father is alive, you know, God bless him. But I see, you know what I mean? It's like crazy things like that where I'll see, like, I don't know. And I feel like a lot of times my nightmares are so, like, they're so strong that when I wake up, I'm drained, you know? Oh. Like, and it kind of, this, that's the reason why those scary movies and things scare me so much because the experiences I feel like that I've had I just can't do it. I can't. I get that. Yeah. Do you feel like you know what that, why you get those dreams so often? Um, I don't know. I feel like, cause I have severe anxiety, like disorder. Um, so half of it is like, I'm mentally insane. And then the other half is like, because I'm mentally insane, I catastrophize so harsh you know mm -hmm. that it's so strong continuously in my brain that it'll come out in my dream if that makes sense like my mm -hmm. subconscious is just like consistently negative 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 did you ever dream about the car does the car ride back from detroit no <laughs> 
Well, that's something um, we could talk about later. <laughs> you want to talk about living a nightmare? <laughs> but um, yeah, stay tuned, guys, because I will be um, the probably the last episode of this season. Oh um, yeah! I can't wait to disclose all of the disgusting things that I have encountered oh in my, my life so far. I can't so, wait. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Gosh. Yes. Well, that was that was a lot to take in. But Paulina, what do you got? What do you got? Okay. So I don't know if I would call this supernatural, but it was creepy as fuck. That's the category. So recently I was staying in LA for about a week and I was at the like it's this huge hospital right across from like the main Scientology building on Sunset Boulevard like in LA so it's this huge Scientology building and what's super crazy is that I could see it like 24 hours a day because my friend that was staying in the hospital I was staying with her and her view was right like you're looking at the Scientology building um, and it was actually really beautiful, too. It's like this massive and they like paint it blue and it's gold and like just really pretty. And I found out that they had bought like half of this block. So literally the street is like named like L. Ron Hubbard, which is like the cult leaders, you know, name. And they had changed this, the street from like black asphalt to like red brick. So. I know it's weird. And then there's all the houses as well, which I didn't know this until this experience I'm about to tell you guys. I didn't know this, but they had even bought like all the houses as well. But what's weird is you can tell like the houses that they didn't buy like on the other side of the street. So as I'm like staying in this hospital, I'm like working, you know, in the cafe throughout the day. And then I'm with my friend and then I'm like going to work and then coming back. Like I'm basically living there, you know? So I'm like hungry. And this one restaurant, like one of my coworkers, friends, like brothers, like owns this restaurant or coworkers, brother basically owns this restaurant. And the food is really amazing, but it's on the other side of this like Scientology building. Like it's right like behind it. So there's two streets I can go on. And so the two streets, one like doesn't have a crosswalk. And then the other one is just tents. Like, you know, there's a big like homeless population in LA. There's a lot of like crime that's going on and there is no sidewalk like there's just tents and tents so i have to like walk on the street with all these cars because i can't walk through the tents and so i mean and at the same time like i did end up walking on that street and like i was getting cat called and people were coming up to me and i'm like i don't know so the only thing is the only like choice i have like i'm like desperately trying to get food i'm like super hungry and so i'm like i'm not gonna walk like you know three blocks like la blocks to like go around to this stupid at this this place right so i go and the first time i mean and there's other cafes on that side too so like i have to figure out like how am i going to start like getting here i have to like walk through the scientology street because the first time i didn't because for the first like day there's tons of cars you guys it doesn't matter what time it is like if you wake up at 2 a.m for some reason there's like 40 cars outside of the Scientology building coming in and out, people getting in and out. It's like the weirdest thing. And then there's also people coming from the church, like approaching people on the sidewalk, like trying to bring them in the church. So I go and I walk on the street the first time and I'm like, whatever, like, I'm, I'm just going to walk through the Scientology, you know, street. So on my way back, I'm like, I'm not walking through the street. So I got my food, like I have my headphones on and I'm just like walking back. Like I see the hospital entrance and I'm like, let me just walk through the street. I had no fucking idea like what I was getting myself into. So on that day, there was this, like they do this like reenactment, reenactment. And everybody is dressed up like maybe like late 1800s style. But 
it's not like you can tell it's like costumey, but there's this like weird vibe to it. Like their faces are all super like pale, like from the makeup. Like the something about the makeup is just like really like crazy. And so people are dressed up like that, but it's not like a festival where like people are talking and like laughing and joking. It's like everyone is really serious. So you're walking through this red brick sidewalk that's so clean. Like you walk off the sidewalk and it's like, you know, you're walking in spit. But when you're on this red brick road, it's like everything is like immaculate. Okay. The houses that they bought, like when you're actually in front of them, they're painted and they're not dusty and like everything's really clean, but there's like no plants oddly. And then there's a stage where like people are doing this play. Right. So there's also randomly like mystical creatures that are also dressed up. So there's like a dragon and like a fairy and then like some other random like creature. And you're like, what? And I'm just walking with my headphones on and I'm like, I think I need to turn these off. But the craziest part is every time I would walk past like any person, they would just stop what they're doing, stop talking and stare at me. And then once I like walked past them like a certain amount, then they would get back to what they're doing. But my heart was racing so bad because I'm like, why are they looking at me? Then finally, when I got to the stage, I'm like shaking, just thinking about how scared I was. I felt like someone was going to kidnap me or something. Everybody from the stage stopped people on a fucking stage stopped doing what they were doing and looked at me like this outsider, like I wasn't supposed to be on the street, but it's still like a public street. Like, you don't, I didn't understand. I mean, I thought it was, maybe it wasn't guys. I don't know, but I clearly did not fit in. Everybody was dressed so well, but they're like this all day. So you wake up at 7 a.m. to like grab a coffee. Motherfuckers from Scientology are dressed to the nines. Like yeah. their hair is immaculate, not one hair out of place. And the kids, oh my gosh, the kids are dressed up immaculate, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Like it's it's weird. And I was just like, I don't know. I was like, God, wherever you are in this world, like, yeah. <laughs> whatever, God, just please protect me. Like, let me get off the sidewalk. And as soon as I walked off of the sidewalk, I turned around and I looked back at them and it really felt like a movie scene. Like everybody just started like moving around and like getting back to normal. And I don't know why that was so scary for me guys, but it was like the creepiest thing I've ever experienced. So the rest of the days I was there, the rest of the week, I was walking through the tents, like motherfuckers selling me drugs. Like, I don't care what you want to do. Like anything is better than that. Wow. That is very eerie. Like, what are they doing? <laughs> I have no idea, you guys. Like, huh. on another level, all day, 24-7, cars, people, in and out, dressed well. Like, it's weird. That reminds me of that movie. I think it's called Big Fish with Danny DeVito in it. I think I've heard of that. I, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, Ain't that Tim Burton. It's a Tim Burton movie. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Ooh, is there a cult in that? I think it is. Yeah. Ooh. It's like it's supposed to be. Um, it's supposed to represent this. Well, I won't say anything. You gotta watch the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to get too much away. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Better yet, uh, next episode of A Better Than I Don't Know. Yeah. <laughs> no, you guys, I was so inspired every day after that. I was just thinking to myself, like, they have all these weird, like, they know that they're like that. And so, like, the signs outside are, like, curious, like, come and take a look. Like, yeah. they know that they're like that and they want to call you in. And, like, it was weird because 
it was almost hypnotizing. So now that I talk about it and like I'm off their trance, like I'm okay. But the next day and the next night, like I couldn't stop looking at their building. And I think they like weird, oddly like knew it. I was like, I can't stop thinking about their faces. And like, they were like calling me in and I kept reading their sign. And I'm like, I know I'm not going to like fall into a cult, but I was like, maybe I could just check it out. Right. <laughs> and so I ended up like meeting like people from the hospital and and like telling my friends about it. I'm like, I think I might just go see the Church of Scientology again. Cause I'm like, what if I'm a part of them? Maybe they won't be so scary, but they were like, do not, you know, like, do not do that. Like that's literally how they get you. Like, don't even go and, and check it out because you will like, you know, you probably will knowing you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. For sure. I was going to ask you that. Totally. What was the vibe you were getting off of that? Cause I can picture just that the air just almost stops. Like the while you were explaining this, I'm like, everything just seems like, yeah, very much like that. Exactly. The air was totally like, I could not breathe. But at the same time, I was so intrigued. Like I was like, I just need more. Like, you know what I mean? It's like living in, in a scary movie. I know guys, it's fucking weird, but it was like, it felt like something you kind of want more of in a weird, sick, twisted way. Yeah. like almost like a siren's call okay yeah, they yeah, make yeah. you feel like the outsider is the mm-hmm. point oh yeah yes. like they make you feel like they want you to yeah mm-hmm. so like if you want to be wanted like yeah you're screwed people are way scarier than the supernatural i feel like i can only watch supernatural horror movies because all the m- movies about people i'm like nope too scared <laughs> too, too, too real <laughs> no I completely agree with that too, because I can deal with ghosts. I can deal with crazy entities, but at the same time, deal with actual real life situations and people, you don't know where to put yourself. Yeah. Cause you don't, you can't necessarily tell the intention after that point, even with animals, like I'm cool with animals, you know, crazy, like large animals. I'm fine with too, even work with bats, mm-hmm. but people mm-hmm. I'm running yeah <laughs> it's like a mountain lion or something because we get those here i'm like it's okay like maul me to death but if it's, like, <laughs> if it's a person i'm like i can't deal with the psychological warfare please yeah. it's, like, it's, warfare. it's so scary and i have a chihuahua i'm very brave <laughs> everyone knows <laughs> <what they're scary. laughs> Honestly, this was such a crazy conversation. I swear. I mean, for the most part, it's like... This is a jam-packed episode, oh, guys. Hands, hands down. And I know for a fact, if we would just... If we would keep going with this, like, I would tell you... Cause there's stories that I want... I would love to tell you guys right now, but I'm like, hmm, we'll just wait for our crossover event on the Romanistan podcast. So if you want to hear some of those, you'll be hearing those on the Romanistan feature. <laughs> Make sure you've got your popcorn for a quarter and your frozen banana for a nickel. <laughs> My so, father used to love the frozen bananas. That's a crack up. <laughs> so, this was so much fun. And um, I always like to, to say this because you guys have so much going on. Again, like you guys and talk, talk about multi hyphenates for sure. And just just your experiences alone are worth hearing just from the Romani Sun podcast. But if there's anything you guys would like to uh, close off with in terms of a message, maybe towards a culture, maybe about approaching these sort of spiritual or like supernatural situations. And then also maybe what you guys would like to push as well, by all means, this is your floor spotlight on whoever wants to go first. Yeah. You know, I think I, so I worked a full day of fortune telling today and um, something that just is on my mind is a lot of people get worried about doing any kind of like protection or cleansing ritual like wrong when you really can't do it wrong. You know, like I think if you have an intention, if you're feeling afraid or if you want to like protect yourself before sleep or like after the day is done, 
like even just washing your hands and asking to, you know, cleanse away everything that, you know, feels harmful to you. Call in any, if you work with any deities, whatever religion you are, if you believe in spirit guides, like whatever you believe in, just ask for that love and protection around you. You really can't screw it up. And it's just a lot of comfort if you're feeling out of whack or if the vibes feel wrong and i think it's also always good to just listen to your intuition even if you feel silly even if for whatever reason you don't feel like going down that street you don't have to honey that's <laughs> like no one's gonna judge you <laughs> do what you feel like and so um yeah i think everyone has a kind of innate intuition um i think roma have had to use it a lot um and any persecuted people have had to use it a lot over the centuries but we all have it so just um just roll with it and <laughs> trust yourself. Awesome. Paulina? Um, let's see. I don't know. My mind is kind of blank. I feel like I can't stop thinking about all of our scary encounters. <laughs> I want to know about the car thing. We'll okay. find out soon. <laughs> yes. I'll find out in a bit. Definitely. <laughs> well, um, yeah. is there anything you want to push or is there anything like that you guys want to promote in that case? Yeah, um, we have a merch shop now and we are, um, so, you know, just to, just to address all the rumors, um, it turns out that Paulina and I are not independently wealthy, nor are we funded by any big organizations. <laughs> um, Relatable. Yes. <laughs> what a surprise that a small Romani podcast would not be doing that. <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, so if you want to support us and support what we do, um, we accept donations. We have a Patreon, but we also have really cute t-shirts and merch. And we just um, added a new line, show love uh, line. And it has like the I Heart Romana sound, like I Heart New York kind of style things. Um, and Paulina and I are writing a book together on Romani fortune telling with Wiser. And we're really excited about it. So stay tuned for that. Do, anything else I should add or you want to add? Um, I think yeah there's just a lot of rumors you guys and also <laughs> people like crazy ass people like don't believe everything you hear and unfollow people that are fucking bad and <laughs> i'm like uh if you see something say something um and at the same time yeah like we're super excited about the book that's like a really big deal for us and yeah, our merch, guys, like support us. <laughs> and yeah, I like the whole show love thing too, because I that's what I love about doing this podcast with you guys. Our community really is, when it comes down to it, built on love and family. And so let's keep that energy going. Yeah. Bingo. No, nah, well, again, thank you both so much. Uh, obviously, you can find Jess and Paulina at Romanistan Podcast on all social platforms at this point basically but majority like where a lot of people find you guys and where i know i was able to find you was tiktok as well as instagram um and then they also have their podcasts on all the major podcast platforms so if you're driving home from work or you're cooking something you're making a little stuffed cabbage or some halushki mm -hmm. go for it you know at that point listen to the podcast it is a believe me if you guys love the charm that you got from them now just imagine when they're in their full swing and they're doing their thing on their podcast as well but we really thank them for not only their friendship for their stories but for coming on and giving us two crazies uh, a <laughs> bit of their time and giving us their spooky vibes as well so we love you both and again thank you so much we'll be hearing from you pretty soon yes hey. <laughs> thank you this was so yeah. fun Thank you. This broadcast of Oberda Darano was brought to you by the talents of Pearson Raquel Horba, creators of Dead Scared Entertainment, with the help of Birosh Garaj. You've been listening to a production from Dead Scared Entertainment, where terror is our tradition. Good night. <laughs>